What is good, everybody? I know you guys are going to be looking forward to this as soon as you read the title because this is something that is overdue on all of my channels. Um, I've been wanting to talk to me, me and him talking. I'm going to set the scene for that here in a little bit. Kevin and I, we do talk uh, quite a bit, uh, but this is the first time that you guys have got to see kind of this play out in this format. So, again, overdue. And I'll apologize for that, but I'm glad we have a perfect opportunity to to get my man's Kevin on considering uh, his his new projects. You know him as the creator, of course, of uh, Blue Marvel. You also know him as a uh, creative for uh, Underworld. I am joined today by the great Kevin Grievous. Brother, how you doing? Hey, man, I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Again, man, I appreciate you taking some time. And, and I want to, like I said, set that scene just so everybody understands context, because I, I don't get, a, I get often get a chance to talk about this. Kevin, whether you know it or not, I think you know it. You were pretty vital, right? And and some of the questions that I had as I was launching the, the Ripperverse, right? And oh, really? I, I, I reached out to you, if you remember, oh. you know, and like having some questions about, okay, reaching out to X person, reaching out to that person. And this was before we had even started it, right? Trying to figure out artists and all that. And, and you kind of, you, you put me in a, in a great direction. It was such, and obviously I mean, considering what came of that, I'm so appreciative of that, but it goes to show, you know, just kind of how much you not only love this industry, but how much you were willing to help. So I wanted everybody to kind of understand that context that, you know, a lot of direction that I got, like as far as getting on the right track with the creation of the Riververse came from uh, my, my chats that I had with Kevin. But with I do want to get right into the fact that obviously Kevin is doing his own independent thing, which is admirable in it, in itself. And recently you, you launched a new I'm going to give you the floor to talk about that recently launched a Kickstarter for Gentara and. I want you to kind of give context who this character is, what the story is about. We'll be showing everything out there for the audience uh, on the screen, but just okay. give us just a, a basic pitch of not only what the character it, it, itself is about this world. It is that it you're also cre creating as well as the uh, Kickstarter. Okay. Well, you know, Jintar was an idea I've had in my head for, you know, for years and only recently, have I had the uh, the wherewithal and the you know the time to finally get it out there, and so you know quite simply it's about a Washington D.C. police detective who is you know sadly terminally ill you know suffering from a form of cancer, and you know at the same time she is she's dealing with a serial killer that has terrorized what we call the D.M.V. for those of us who lived in D.C. and so uh, but you know on her journey she finds out that she is a descendant of an ancient race of jinn, who we all know as genies. And now she has a dilemma, you know, does she, you know, reject this dark power, you know, given, you know, given her background, or does she embrace it knowing that it could lead down this path of destruction because of its, uh, its dark seduction? So, you know, it's how this character, you know, uh, basically goes through this journey, uh, tries to find herself and who she is now that she has this, uh, you know, this new status quo and how that affects her. And so, you know, it really deals with a lot of the things that I like, you know, fantasy, you know, um, you know, police dramas, you know, hard boiled detective work, yeah. things of that nature. And so I thought I'd combine all those together and really do something that's tasty. You know what I'm saying? You know, something I could get into. And so that's where we are now. And I'm already writing the screenplay for me yeah. to hopefully direct one day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, I try to make sure, you know, I do a lot of things to get this, uh, get this up and running and moving. Yeah. And again, we're going to have obviously all the links that are going to be in the description, pinned comments, all of that good stuff. And of course, as we go uh, continue to talk with Kevin, we'll be showing that uh, everything as far as the interiors that are available uh, to you all as well. And you guys should, of course, go support Gentar over there at uh, Kickstarter. Look, how has that been? I have to ask that question because you have obviously Dark Storm Comics and everything that you're doing uh, as a creative on the independent tip. Uh, considering your your previous uh, accomplishments, how has that been for you 
And really, I would love for you to explain like kind of what that differentiation is where, you know, you're kind of operating in your own sandbox here. Yeah, well, you know, this is my first Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be some learning curves and some bumps and some, you know, along the road that I'm going to have to deal with, the least least of which is, you know, can I get funded? You know, um, I was thinking of, you know, how much should I ask for things like that, because this is a project that came out uh, through Zenoscope and myself, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago. And we finished up in uh, 2022 when I wanted to combine them all into a trade paperback and also add some cool behind the scenes, you know, material, add some uh, some new pages, you know, you know, story pages, things of that nature to really make it a, a cool package and presentable. So, you know, this is new territory for me, but, you know, you know, the comic book world, if this is what you're asking, you know, you know, can differ greatly from, you know, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though they're, you know, now they're both highly sought after, uh, the comic book industry is so incestuous, it's hard to really navigate and get into and even stay, you know, to an extent. Uh, Everyone, I, and I don't mean everyone, I'm, I'm just speaking in generalities, you know, everyone has their 15 minutes in comics, but the goal is to get that 30 minutes or that 45 minutes or that hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the real problems. Like I've, I've done some things that I'm proud of, but you know, the, the turnover ratio is so, and the attrition rate is so high. It's like, you know, how do you get in unless you're, you know, absolute friends with right. someone. And even then that is no guarantee. So I used to I used to say a lot of time there's no money in comics, but given what people like yourself have done, you know, with crowdfunding and the like, uh, yes, there is. Yeah. There, you know, there can be because you're going directly to the customer, you know, and I think that works better. You can have you build your own relationship with them. You don't have any middlemen. You don't have anyone you know, telling you, okay, well, you can write this, but you can't write that. Oh, we disagree with how this character sounds and all that stuff. So it's been a new experience. It's been a good experience doing crowdfunding, even though, like I said, I'm just two days in, (laughs) you know, but hopefully this will be the first of many. Most definitely. And it looks like that's going to be the case, which is why I'm so excited that we're able to get some eyes um, uh, on this because look with, kind of understanding and we've talked about this a little bit like there are everybody is talking about certain issues that may have plagued this industry and you know yes. what better way than to resolve that than to kind of have this setup where you're able to go directly to the to the customers and we don't have all those middlemen who also got to kind of take their money off the top uh, as yeah. well and yeah there's a lot of money in it which means a lot more creativity in it because you can see this thing come into um, fruition. So the the more people that we have that are just I- extremely talented, being able to, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, do that, uh, I yeah. think it's so very important. It's so very vital. And, and this is why I'm glad that it is that you're doing this, because I, I think that uh, it's such a necessary thing. And look, I don't know what it's going to look like on the other side. I've been open about this and said, like, yeah. hey, As this comic book industry starts to change, more people start to enter into kind of doing what it is that we're doing. uh, Yeah, it it looks different, right? It it looks different. And where does that kind of um, like the more older model fall in that? I have no idea. But I do think this is far more beneficial for uh, the creatives that are going to be involved because ultimately that's that's what it's going to be about. So. I think that experience is going to be, um, uh, I think, th- think huge. And everybody, I mean, I had, I took my lumps for sure, uh, more so technically than anything. Oh, with yeah. like, with like some ones kind of <laughs> released, you know, and, and trying to figure this out. And everybody's learning along the way. But that's that's the fun, also part of the experience is figuring out kind of what works for for uh, each individual person. So you know, obviously, I, I, I wish you the best with that. Well, thank you, sir. Most definitely. But so you got Gentar, is there anything I, I know you're, you, we're obviously only a day into it. Right. Yeah. But you know, it is doing, uh, it's doing solid. Like as far as people get behind a project. So how far does that go in your mind, given that if you can, if this 
does become, I know you kind of talked a little bit about like screen right screen plays like how far are you trying to uh i mean from an aspiration standpoint kind of take kind of your own thing it is you're doing here yeah i'm I'm trying to take it to the point where i could actually build a studio that's my ultimate goal okay you know you, you know to build a film studio in fact one of the places we're looking at is in texas you there know you go. and so you know we're looking at texas we're looking at you know uh, the DVM, we're looking at Canada to try to really build, you know, uh, this entertainment hub, you know, uh, such as it is. And, you know, creating your own IPs is paramount to doing that and and making and getting and having some kind of control over what it is that you do. Because, you know, film, for good or for ill, is extremely collaborative and sometimes in a way in which you don't like, you know, <laughs> like I had a hard time with I Frankenstein. I thought that would get me out of the underworld umbrella and really bring me into this new arena. But my goodness, you know, once people start getting their hands on, it's all, oh, can yeah. we can do this or this and the other thing. Well, you know, we don't necessarily like this direction, even though when I handed in the screenplay, we're like, oh my goodness, right. this is going to be something else. Then mugs start getting cold feet. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's like then they change things, and before you know it, and now nah. <laughs> you know yeah. it's just not yeah. working. So my goal is to really be as self-sufficient as I can. You know, so you know you can take these creative products as far as they may go. You know, and you know that's one of the reasons why I tell a lot of people you know, who get in the industry, who want to do a particular thing. I tell them to kind of diversify their creative lexicon. Oh yeah. And the reason I say that is because you might want to be a writer, fine, but how long is it going to take you? You better do something else in order to supplement your income or get into another aspect of the, of the creative industry, because it can be a bear. It can be difficult. Like I did not come out to Hollywood to be an actor at all did not want it, but my writing, you know, wasn't taking off like I wanted to. And, you know, I'd be on set and let me, you know, just set this up a little bit. I did a lot of extra work and, you know, what the extra work did is allowed me to be around creatives without having to wait tables or fall back on my, you know, science degree, you know, because I felt that if I, if I went into the plan B, then I was taking a step back and I would probably, you know, wind up capitulating and just right. fall back on that. And I did not want that. So to me, doing the extra work, for instance, that was like the best free film school, you know, you could ever attend. If you do two things, if you, number one, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and two, if you're very, very observant, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then you can strategically ask questions on how to get into various you know, um, aspects of the industry. And look, because of, you know, my size or the size that I have, I would kind of stand out. And, you know, because of my voice, I would stand out. Yep. So I started, you know, you know, moving around, like, let's say the stuntmen, you know what I'm saying? Because they're generally athletes, bigger guys, things mm -hmm. like that. It was to getting acting parts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, I met Lynn Wiseman, who was the director of Underworld, doing extra work on Stargate. So we struck up a friendship, and then look what happens. That's you see crazy. what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, you know, everything can dovetail. And, you know, looking at comic books, I mean, I tried to get into the comic book industry back in, like, 87. I submitted a couple of short stories. And, of course, I got rejection letters, you know. But I never thought I would actually get in after that. But... You know, after Underworld, then Marvel called. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I was able to get in. So I know I'm saying a lot and kind of rambling, but. No, no, this is perfect. <laughs> this is the perspective that I wanted you to give because, I mean, you bring it up. It's a perfect point as far as the kind of diversifying there, right? As far as being able to do multiple things and being very, very observant. You know, that's kind of what happened even with the creation of of, of some of the, the uh, let's say, the ventures that I've had over like doing music and then having that writing for exactly. that turning to X, turning to Y. And a lot of even the relationships that I have with uh, members of the Ripperverse were, were people that, you know, I'd connected with along the way. And that's such, you know, perspective because 
uh, oh, that's great perspective because that, that is very similar with, with, with you there. And I think that the audience should understand that as far as, you know, be, instead of being like a good, uh, just a one trick pony and I get it, it may work for some other people, but you never kind of know what your breakout's going to be. Uh, because even like you said, you know, you, you've done so many other things and I, I think that, 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 that's huge. And so, you know, going back to kind of to that point where, you know, you broke in, to the comic book industry kind of be, be whether it be because of underworld um, or after or whatever. So kind of how was that experience? Obviously people know you for the you know, blue Marvel and being the creator um, yeah. uh, of that, but how was that overall uh, a- a experience kind of uh, being able to, cause you've done some DC work as well, uh, but yeah. also being, being able to kind of uh, just do work really in, in the mainstream, which I guess for some people, for a lot of folks that that was the dream, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I, I've been collecting comic books since I was 12 years old. But like I tell people, I was a monster kid first. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So from the time I was six, you know, when we, you know, I you know, was from Minnesota, you know, uh, I got into that. Then we moved to Boston and that, you know, further fueled my love for monsters. And so I didn't get into comic books until much later when I was 12. And, you know, it was like a world just opened up to me, you know, and, you know, just find, found it so fascinating, you know, I mean, the various characters, you know, the different worlds. And the thing is, you know, when you, back then, you know, the covers kind of match what was in the book, right? And it was action oriented. Right. And, you know, it was a, it was a young boy's medium. And so they were kind of like, you know, if I can use this analogy, they were like paper versions of Saturday matinee movies. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you would, you know, open these things up, you know, fight drama, fight drama, fight drama. And it's like, my goodness, you know, it was just a smorgasbord of, you know, of fun and excitement. And so that's what I try to bring to my work and, you know, try to get into and, you know, so, you know, back then I was so into him, I created this character and which was a precursor to Blue Marvel. Mm -hmm. So when I got into Marvel, I said, you know what, maybe it's time for me to, you know, shake this off and see if I can get it done. And the rest is history, you know. And, you know, that was a good experience. You know, in fact, I wrote a spec script, um, you know, that actually got the ball rolling. And, you know, my friend Paul Jenkins he helped me, he introduced me to Tom Brevoort and they snapped it up, you know, right away, almost right away. Yeah. You know, so that was a good experience. Now uh, looking at what has been, <laughs> looking at where I am now and my association with the character, you know, it's a shame they won't let me get back in there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like, you know what, you know, and it makes me question whether or not I should have given it to them in the first place. I can see but that. the reason I did is because it would not have necessarily worked in my own universe. Mm. This was a bigger, bigger platform. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And sometimes you just have to roll the dice and take the chance. You know, one of the things I say to people um, with my experience in Hollywood, you have to give the first one or two away, you know, because sometimes that's the price of entrance. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's just a sad reality, you know? And so that's what I did. But, you know, I'm coming up with, uh, you know, usually when those things happen, you know, it's way to turn, you know, lemons and lemonade. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I can say that, you know, um, you go in and you do something else. It's like, OK, well, next time I know, you know, now I have my character Darkstorm. And so with that character, um, I happen to get friendly with uh, Charlemagne the God. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so now he picked that up and he was like, yo, let's work together. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, you, know, you know, and it's like, you know, you just find a way to always be creating, always trying to network, always trying to get to the next level. And it could be tedious, arduous, yeah. but that's the name of the game. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Oh, that, 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 tell me about yeah. it. That, that's for sure yeah, the name, name of the yeah, game. I yeah. try to tell people. God never promised anybody a rose garden. Oh, yeah. Except for Adam and Eve. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they jacked it up. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, again, and that's, um, 
I can say so it's admirable to 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 see that because now, you know, we're, we're seeing things come full circle there because I've seen and I've had the luxury of talking to and with a lot of creatives that have you know been around the block. Right. And, yeah, and a couple yeah. of them being even here, like we like Chuck Dixon and, and, and Joe, Joe Bennett. And, yeah. you know, it, it's it is one of those things where it's like, man, you got this character that you, you of course, created. You don't necessarily regret creating it, but it's like. Ah, you see some of the direction and, you know, you were really the original concept, right? And maybe you see the direction that they're going in. He's like, that's not really what I envisioned, what that character was supposed to be, the setting or or whatever. But it's one of those things where you kind of bite the bullet. However, I do love to see uh, that people are able to a lot of uh, like absolute legends are able to kind of do stuff like what it is that you're doing with the guitar, uh, do other things like uh, what, what Chuck's been able to do with he, even his own individual um, uh, accomplishments. I love even seeing, I remember with you being able to collaborate with Compass Comics and and what Graham Nolan was doing with the, uh, you yes, know, yes, Super, yes. Uh, uh, Manly, Manly Tales. Uh, th- that's yeah. cool. That, that's awesome because it's kind of, you know, it's, it's an independent project, but it's also people being able to, that we've seen do awesome things in a different setting, maybe be able to, to, to just create uh, and really, their own and their own thing. So this is why I hope that uh, that that the, you know the ultimate end game that it is that you have with the whole studio thing. I think would be uh, that'd, be, that'd be absolutely killer because I mean, kind of what we're starting to see even that with the decentralization of of, uh, of certain technological aspects uh, yeah. as well as just uh, the means being uh, far more affordable. It's it's real. And you've been around longer than I get. I have. So you can probably speak to this, that it's a lot more realistic. Right. Um, yeah. To be able to do your own thing than what it had been. Maybe even when you were first starting in comics, which that was maybe been a pipe dream. If you were trying to like in the, in the late 80s oh, yeah. trying to do something like that. Well, now it's like, well, you have the uh, Indiegogo's or the Kickstarters or or like uh, self-funding platforms or whatever it is. And that in itself is just completely changed the game. So I would hope yeah. that and I believe that it will for you uh, uh, kind of turn this into something awesome, and which is why I wanted to ask you. I had to ask you about Underworld and, and kind of conceptualizing of that. I know the great Saska sisters who, you know, do a lot of work with us and being horror, yeah. horror folk are going to gonna love uh, your perspective uh, on that. But, like, how was that? I know you talked about pitching it and all that, but what was what was that? Because that was that that was kind of a big break of sorts. You also were in it, you know. But yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. What, what happened uh, with that, and how did that come into fruition? Well, what happened is that, like I mentioned before, um, I was friends with Lynn Wiseman already, and he was uh, I want to say a burgeoning director, uh, even though he had only done music videos, you know, up to that point. And so I remember uh, he called me and he said he had just had a meeting with Dimension Films. Uh, and Dimension Films was looking for a werewolf project uh, to do, you know, as well as Blade did for the, you know, vampire genre. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right. So, you know, he knew what kind of work I did. We liked the same kind of movies. And he called me. He was like, you know, what do you think? You know, because the scripts he was getting you know, when he finally got with ICM were terrible, you know, I mean, there was even, I think there was a script um, with Sam Jackson, Sam Jackson was attached and it was kind of like the TV version of the Incredible Hulk meets Die Hard. Mm. And it's like, it was bad, but you know what? It had money attached to it and Sam Jackson yeah. So all he had to do is say yes, and they get the ball rolling, but he didn't want to do that. And so, you know, uh, when he told me about it, I was like, well, I'm not really sure because werewolves are not as, um, if I can say this in the context, they're not as sexy as vampires. And the werewolf genre, it was kind of behold, I shouldn't say beholden, uh, it was kind of limited by the technology too. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. Because your hair, the hair was usually matted. You know, uh, the transformations were slow, you know, because everyone wanted to see the makeup effects. There were only two werewolf movies, modern times to be, you know, totally speak of. And that was The Howling and American Werewolf in London. And so I told him, if we can have a bipedal snout-nosed creature like, you know, those movies, I'm down. 
So he was like, okay, well, you know, what do you need? I said, well, let me think about it for, you know, a week and I'll come up with something. And so he actually liked the idea I came up with. Um, I can't remember much about it now, but when we met to talk about it and to kind of bring out the story, I, I had this thing in the back of my head because of um, this kind of sad, kind of unfortunate story that happened with a buddy of mine, you know, another writer and his partner. And they had a meeting at, just a quick segue, they had a meeting at Jim, the Jim Henson company, you know, and they were trying to pitch their new project. And you know how sometimes you do the, you know, the, you know, the small talk, you know, before mm -hmm. you really get into it. And so after they finished that, he says, okay, well, we'll look, you know, he said, well, what do you guys have? And, it was, and my friend was like, well, we have this Bigfoot story. And what we were thinking, the guy held up his hands up, we already have a Bigfoot story. What else you got? And he and his partner looked at each other. was like, uh, <laughs> you know, nothing. Yeah. And the guy was like, well, hey, you know, you guys are, are thinking something else. Please come back. We'd be glad to have you. They never got in that room again. Wow. So that was their opportunity. And it was blown. And I did not want that to happen with us. So when Len and I had our session, I said, I have another idea, you know, and just don't say anything until I finish. And because if they don't like our idea, then what do we have? He was like, well, you know, what is it? I said, what if we did a Romeo and Juliet story, but instead of Monty using Capulets, we have werewolves on one side, but vampires on the other and make it like this surrealistic interracial love story that takes place doing the backdrop of a 600 year old race war. You know what I'm saying? And I remember that cat, you know, you know, crossed his arms, looked at his feet, was like, I don't know, man, is this going to work? And here we are five mm -hmm. movies later. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my inspiration was, you know, some interracial dating I have done, you know, also the fact that, like I told you before, I'm a monster kid. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you look at House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, you know, I'm like, those, they all, all the monsters fought each other, you know, and it's like, why don't we do more of that? Why don't they do that? And, you know, Underworld actually got rejected by everyone in town, you know, because you had a new director, new writer, and a concept people did not understand because the people who are in charge, you know, a, a lot of them are cool, but they didn't grow up liking comic books yeah. and monster movies. They didn't build models, things like that. And so, but I did. And so it was kind of hard to get them to see what we were talking about. And in fact, one of the producers asked me, it's like, well, do you think people are gonna understand the difference between the lichens and the vampires. I'm like, you're asking me that now when we're on set? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you know, the same producer, I remember he said to me, he wanted, he wanted the 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 lichens, the werewolves, to look like Sabretooth in the X-Men. You know, and I'm talking about like mutton chops, yeah. long yeah. fingernails, you know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. like, how yeah. how does that look like a creature yeah. that's yeah. gonna make this thing cool? It's not, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, you know, that's the nature of the creative industry. You know, you're, you know, you are, you are, you know, you have to capitulate off times to the people who have the money. Like with I Frankenstein, it's like, I objected to the changes that they made. They took away my guns. Yeah. They yeah. changed the story. And their thing is like, you know, well, do you have $55 million? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, like, yeah. I'm, a couple, I'm a couple of bucks short. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> nah, you know, know, in, in those situ situations, you kind of bite the bullet, right? Uh, and so I, I totally get that. Uh, and again, that's why I think the independent stuff is uh, it, it's so who uh, important to the the future because i do believe that that's going to be kind of the avenue that people are going to be able to say okay well i don't have to make the concessions that it is that i would have made had i pitched this to just typical hollywood studio or or, or or whatever so again like i want you to be great 
there and we're all rooting for you there, which brings me to more of a creative question, which I have to ask, obviously, as a writer and you being around uh, the block a lot, a lot longer than me. Like, what is your approach to to writing? I mean, you can even use guitar if you want to as a, as an example. And does that differentiate? Because I had the reason why I set this up. The reason why I asked this question is because. Uh, like, for example, the Saskas uh, uh, approach it because, you know, they're being f- filmmakers, directors. They approach it in a very, very similar way. And when they would come up with a comic book, as well as uh, how they write, like, let's say a script. But for you as a creative, uh, what is that? What is that experience? How does it look and how does it differentiate, if at all, from, OK, I have this comic book character in, in mind or comic book in mind versus, OK, I'm doing something that's more so going to be writ- wrote for film or TV. Yeah, I I think that, you know, a lot of times you have to look at your story and you have to determine whether or not it's a feature, it's a short, does it work better as a comic book or a novel? You know what I'm saying? You know, and, you know, it really depends on how much mileage you think you can get out of it. One of the things I will tell you that I do, I don't think it's a, a huge secret, but I try to look at what hasn't been done before or what hasn't been done well. Okay. And trying to figure out how to maneuver in that world after that. It's like, okay, uh, like for instance, Underworld, um, I can't remember any werewolf versus vampire thing, except for there was this 1961 movie, uh, very schlock, called Vampire Woman Meets the Werewolf, something like that. And I remember that. And I'm thinking, well, you know, why don't, why hasn't this ever been done by like Universal? Well, they didn't look at these monsters as races. You know what Mm. I'm saying? Mm. You know, so that metaphor couldn't be there, whatever you wanted to make it be. They looked at them as one off creatures. So my thing, and one of the things I got dinged about by producers is that, well, can werewolves be part of a, a race? Are there a lot of them? Vampires, are there a lot of them? Th- things like that. And I'm like, well, why not? You yeah. know? And so, you know, my thing was to do that and also bring in the scientific nature of these creatures. Because, you know, mysticism can, can tend to go awry in so many different ways unless you really know the rules. And then sometimes you have to make them up to make your story work. But, you know, I brought that to the table as well. And so my approach is to try to find a way to do things that haven't been done before. Or, like I said, you know, if they have and they haven't been done well, you know, ask the question, why hasn't it been done like this before? And that's where you can really get a lot of mileage out of a story you have. Because, you know, a lot of things have been done before, right? you know, um, you know, but just not the way you would do them, you know, or the way I would do them. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, most definitely. No, it it does. And I I love how you bring it up as far as, um, you know, the approach is appropriate for what it's appropriate for, right? It's like, okay, what what is the concept here of what it is? And you bring up mileage as a perfect term to kind of use as far as, because that could completely change the dynamic of the story it is that you want to tell, right? like uh, I say this obviously with what it is that we're trying to do here and how like the universe and the expansion of it is a big selling point and what it is that we focus on. So, you know, with the story like I some one or I some two, it's uh, it, it, it's in that context. It's wrote in that context because, you know, I'm trying to think of it years uh, uh, from now um, uh, sh- should the customers uh, allow it to. So that, that's actually a great, great perspective. Uh, definitely for Asper. Yeah, and you also want to look at too. You know, what you bring to it personally, what does what do you as a writer or a creator have to say? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. How do you how would you like the world to be, you know, and deal with it from that standpoint? You know, um, I love, you know, superheroes and, you know, I like, you know, sometimes I I think um, what has happened to the comic book industry is that. A lot of the creators, a lot of the companies, you know, they lost the ability to have fun. Mm. You know, it's like whatever happened to fun, whatever happened to adventure. You know what I'm saying? Now, characters are sitting around angsty and talking all the time. And you're like, what is this? I I don't get it. Like there was a uh, 
a, a Batgirl story, I think I saw once. And she's in the bathroom for two pages, you know, looking at her teeth, you know, on the toilet, you know, and I'm like, what editor gives a, you know, gives a permission to waste this amount of real estate? You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That doesn't work. And who wants to read that? You know, that's why you've never seen a superhero go to the bathroom. No one wants to see that. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> you not, know, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, that's what I want to say. Yeah. You know, and so, um, you know, the goal is to, you know, have something to say, you know, have some principles that make these things worthwhile. Because a lot of times in the past, uh, these these stories were morality tales. Absolutely. And, and that kept people coming back. It was a way to teach young kids right from wrong, you know. There weren't all these shades of gray, even though that's real life. Right. I think, you know, comic books are kind of like a controlled escapism. You know okay. what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that simplicity, there's nothing wrong with that kind of simplicity. And even though, like the next guy, you know, I love Dark Knight Returns, I don't want to see all comic books like that. You right, see what right. I'm saying? It makes sense. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So no, they, I mean you put that perfectly. You put that perfectly for sure with um, w- with kind of the fun uh, aspect of it, and you know the way I've always worded it. I think a lot of mainstream products, if you will, IPs are dealing with that same kind of issue where it's like the enthusiasm problem is what I what I call yeah, call it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where you know you got people that. <laughs> It's got to a point, definitely, maybe to your point, maybe it's because of these, the, the, these either lost its way or people are going into it with the same kind of approach and that it feels more like a chore to be a, 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 a consumer of that product, customer of that product, uh, as opposed to just being really stoked. And I think that does have a lot to do with the fun, fun aspect of it that I think is lost for so many products. And I, I love to see that there's independence trying to, to really inject that life uh, back, back into it because it's so, it's so necessary. I think for a lot of us uh, definitely growing up, that was what it was about. You know, it was a blast to just read that stuff. And it was even more of a blast to talk to other people that were reading it in fandoms and exactly. that was what this stuff was about and it's kind of kind of deviate from deviated from that uh, uh you know i wanted to uh just quickly i was going to the gentar and kind of the the scope of what it is or where you mentioned i, I love that you kind of got this blend of, of different different elements where you have uh the, the aspect of like the monster stuff that you're very familiar with but also uh just a just a, a dab of the superheroism uh, which is it's not done maybe enough. I think a lot of people limit them stu- limit uh, a lot of the superhero stuff to hey, it's just got to be someone in tights running around doing their thing. So yeah. uh, 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 how how does Jintar kind of? It, it is kind of more of a mesh of of all these various concepts. You bring detective work in there. Uh, yeah. How easy or rather difficult for you is to uh, for it to be be it coherent and and for it to be something that the the, the audience wants to get into uh, that. That's a creative challenge. I'd imagine uh, for at least a lot of other people, how was your approach creatively uh, w- with uh, bringing about like a story like Jintar? Well, you know, basically, you know, when you have a fish out of water story and you're not trying to create a superhero per se, just a person with powers, you can, you know, it, it's not as difficult as you might think. Uh, mostly because the, not, I don't want to say fanaticism. It's more like the fantasy element in a realistic world makes your characters incredulous about what they're experiencing. And so you get a lot of mileage out of that story-wise because they're trying to, you know, basically deny what they're seeing and what they're experiencing. And then there have, you have this mentor character who says, no, this is very real and here's why, you know? And so that journey is what makes it interesting because, you know, you, you know, you, it's kind of like a, 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 an analogy with what would happen in our world. You know, you see something supernatural, you're going to be like, you have got to be kidding me. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that, and that disbelief that you might have amidst the fact that, you know, something is really going on here. It's something that's quite fascinating and you can play with even within a fictional world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, and, and so I like that. 
And so for me, Jintara, you know, given the fact that she's, you know, kind of like us going through the things that we go through, the hardships of doing her job. And on top of all this, you know, she winds up, you know, having ter- being terminally ill, no, you know, no. and has to work and fight through it. Or else most people who are terminally ill would just, you know, just rot, you yeah, know, sit down yeah, and rot. Yeah. But, but we can't do that. Right. You know, and so there's some relatability there with how do you continue on? And I think that journey is what will draw people in, you know, and that's what I'm looking for. That's, that's huge, man. And like I said, that it's man. I mean, the way that you kind of word that is even kind of putting me on game for sure. Uh, especially with that, as far as perspective. So man, that's, 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 that's free game there. And I guess I end on this though, because I often do when I talk to people about kind of, uh, creative folks that are doing things uh, definitely in the independent space, uh, yeah. I know we're all learning along the way, but, you know, yeah. with the experience it is that you have, and I, I, I'll end on this note, the experience it is that you have and considering all that you've gone through and to get you to this point, we can leave it as vague as just something creative. Maybe it's not just for a writer. Maybe it's not just for an artist or a director or whatever it, it, it may be. Is there anything as far as other uh, advice that you would give as far as that person that is coming up in the game, uh, considering your experiences, uh, what not to do, what to do. Is there any like advice to you that sticks out that you think maybe people should, I don't want to say abide by, but at least heed to uh, and and try to understand and wrap their minds around uh, should they get in a position to where they're able to uh, uh, live out um, uh, and try to actually give it a shot in in being the creative person that they want to be. I would say, And it's really simple. If you're serious, once you put your hand on that yoke, don't let go. You know what I'm saying? Because if you let go, uh, you don't eat. (laughs) You know, 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 if you don't, you know, if you don't, you know, if you let go of the yoke, you know, the work won't get done. And it could be back to the brick pits. Now, if you make a conscious decision to say, I don't want this anymore, that's one thing. But if you're giving up because you're frustrated, well, you better you better, you know, put your hands on that yoke all the more because this is par for the course, baby. You know, ain't no turning back. (laughs) So that's what I would say. I love that. I love that. Well, Kevin, man, we're going to make this have to happen. Uh, uh, more often than not, man, it's been, it's been a wonder to to have you here and and talk about your creative projects. It is that you're working with, but as well as just the just the overall experience of uh, of creativity. We, yeah. we wish you well. Everybody that is watching this, you have to go visit. And I have the links everywhere that you can see him. Uh, uh, the Kickstarter. Go support uh, Kevin. So it's just one of his as far he's done other. He's been part of projects that have had. Uh, uh, campaigns per se, but as far as this being his own kind of baby, this is uh, one of his first tries at it. So we got to support this man. Uh, he's more than deserving of it, man. And again, just extremely helpful to me, man. And hopefully we can we can have more conversations uh, here uh, because again, I think a, a, your perspective is unique and it's very insightful, man. So I appreciate you yeah. so much, man. And uh, right. I wish you the best with everything it is that you're doing. Hey, brother, I appreciate you, man. Much love. You know what I'm talking about. All day, all day. All right, and that'll end it there, Ben. Up next for the Riververse this fall is Alpha Core, number one, written by one of the most prolific writers of all time, Chuck Dixon. Penciled by the legendary Joe Bennett, you're not going to want to miss this book. Visit Riververse.com to stay up to date and grab ISOM number one to get caught up on the first appearance of Alpha Core.